Hey guys out there, whoever may be coming to see or watch this. Uh, my name is Kelly Powers. Welcome to The Brand Perspective. I've been asked by numerous people to do some kind of video in response to Proverbs 8, 22 and respond to Jehovah's Witnesses or other groups, maybe Unitarians or Seventh-day Adventists or whoever. Uh, and so I want to do that today for those of you who may come in live. It's great. It's in the middle of the afternoon on a Monday. Hope you're doing great. If you haven't subscribed to the Brain Perspective YouTube channel, please do. This is my website, rootedinchrist.org. All right. So today what I want to discuss is really, does Proverbs 8.22 teach that this is talking about Jesus Christ? Now, if you may or may not know what is going on in Proverbs chapter 8, um, there's a few important things to point out. So for the context, I just want to highlight this here. For Jehovah's Witnesses, predominantly, um, you know, the New World Translation is their preferred translation. Of course, they will read other translations, King James and others, to try to prove their points. But I'm going to focus a few things on from the New World Translation. I'm also going to put up some things on the screen for you to, to, to watch, to check out. And this wasn't scheduled, so nobody really knows about this directly. I'm just kind of just doing this on the spot. If anyone comes in, I'm going to say hello. And, of course, if you're, um, you know, um, catching this afterwards, well, thank you for checking it out. And please watch the whole thing and share it with other people. All right. So let's look at Proverbs uh, chapter 8 quickly here. I'm going to go to a um, couple tabs I have here online. I'm going to go first to the New World Translation. And you can kind of see this here. And just going to kind of see how this looks so you can kind of see what's going on. So I'm not, uh, obviously you can tell uh, the JW Org website, I'm at their website, Proverbs, it's a New World Translation. So what I want to highlight here is, of course, uh, the main verses is verse 22. Of course, it all goes down to uh, verse 30. So this is important. So uh let's just start off here so jehovah produced me here it says here in verse 22 as the beginning of his way the earliest of his achievements of long ago from ancient times i was installed from the start from the times earlier than the earth when there was no deep waters i was brought forth when there was no springs overflowing water before the mountains were set in place before the hills i was brought forth when he had not yet made the earth and its fields or the first clods of the earth's soil, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he marked out the horizon of the surface of the water, when he established the clouds above, he founded, founded the fountains of the deep. When he set a decree for the sea that its waters should not pass beyond his order, when he established the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him. As a master worker, I was there as one he was especially fond of day by day. I rejoiced before him all the time. All right. So now that, just so you know, is uh, obviously that is the New World Translation. Now let's stop that for a second. And let's do the other one here just to read as well. I'm going to go to uh, the King James here. Now, this is obviously from, as you could tell, Bible Hub. Bible Hub is a great website, by the way, for any of you out there who are Bible students. There's many things on here. You can look at Strong's. There's Interlinear. There's Lexicons. Um, they have different things, sermons. There's even some comment commentaries. Numerous Bible translations you can check out. Now, myself, I predominantly prefer the New American Standard Translation, but in most cases, when you're talking to a Mormon, a Latter-day Saint, a Jehovah's Witness, um, Seventh-day Adventists and other groups out there. Um, other than Seventh-day Adventists, uh, most people will normally gravitate to the King James. And I'm not against King James. I'm just saying that's what I will normally use if I'm talking to one of these kind of groups, just to keep it more on the same page. So now notice Proverbs 8 here. I'm going to go back to verse 22 here. And we're going to read again the same verses, but we're going to read it from the King James. The 
Lord possessed in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there's no depths, I was brought forth. When there was no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the earth were, was, I was brought forth. While as of yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the field, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass on the face of the earth, circle, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the fountains of the earth, then I was beside him as one brought up with him. I was his daily delight, rejoicing always before him. So now what's important here is you read both translations. This is so important. When you're reading the New World Translation, when you're reading um, the King James, if you're reading the New King James, New American Standard, it doesn't really matter. Um, you want to examine the context. So here's a few points. Now, I know within the Christian realm, there are scholars and there are people out there who are really, really educated who do actually say and believe that these verses do point to Jesus Christ. I, I recognize that. But as noted before, we're going to look what the scriptures tech talk about. So I just referenced and read all the way from New World Translation. I just now read from the King James. So what I'm going to now do is try to get your attention for something here. Let's go back to um, the translation here at hand. Even if we were reading the New World Translation as I was just a moment ago, notice the following here in Proverbs 8, okay? When you're reading Proverbs chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, all those chapters, the central theme from all those chapters is predominantly the word wisdom. Wisdom is personified over and over and over in the chapters. This is what's called Hebrew poetry. Now, notice in the beginning of, of chapter 8, is not wisdom calling out? <clears throat> is not discretion raising its voice on the heights along the road it takes its position at the crossroads next to the gates leading to the city at the entrance of the doorways it keeps crying out loudly to you O people i am calling i raise my voice to everyone you inexperienced ones learn shrewdness you stupid ones acquire under an understanding heart listen for what I say is important. My lips speak what is right. My mouth softly utters truth. My lips detest what is wicked. All the sayings of my mouth are righteous. None of them are twisted or crooked. They are all straightforward to the discerning and right to those who have found knowledge. Take my discipline over silver, knowledge rather than finest gold. For wisdom is better than corals. All, all other desirable things cannot compare to it. This is Hebrew poetry. Look at this again, verse 12. I, wisdom, dwell with shrewdness. I have found knowledge and thinking ability. Now, in the King James here, it says, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. Prudence. I have found knowledge and discretion in the King James here. Here's the point. If wisdom is supposed to be personified as an actual real person here, then you have to go down the line, literally down the line, and start naming all the other people, shrewdness or prudence. Well, who's prudence? Who's knowledge? Who's discretion? And you got to go through all these verses and now start making them personified to a personage if a person is going to have to go to that, that depth and lengths to try to prove this isn't actually this is actually talking about Jesus Christ. And you gotta go do that all from chapter one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It can't be done. You know why? Because that's not right. It's unbiblical. It's unbiblical to read into Hebrew poetry here something that is not there. That's an important point. Now, again, reading from the New World Translation, here's an important point. Here's where a verse that's kind of under content, under controversy, right? It's the verse 22. Jehovah produced me as the beginning of the way. This is the Hebrew word quana, Q-A-N-A-H. Now, let me go back over here 
And let's see who's going. I don't know who's all in the room. Hello. How are you guys? I am going to go to a different thing here. And let's see if it pops up here. There we go. Let me go over here to um, Strong's, again, Bible Hub. Check out Bible Hub. Now, of course, again, you can look this up yourselves. So this is the word there that I just read from the New World Translation. It has the word produced in the King James, New King James, New American Center. All those words are to have the word possessed, something that was always with God from eternity. Now, that makes a whole lot more sense because God always has wisdom. There's never a point where wisdom was not with God and God did not have wisdom, right? I mean, that's just kind of common sense. So wisdom from the Hebrew poetry from chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, all fit contextually pointing to that this is talking about Hebrew poetry, not about a specific person, and namely not talking about Jesus Christ. Now notice here for the way that this can be translated, can be translated acquire, acquired, acquirers, bought, buy, buyer, buying, buys, form, gain, acquisition, gain, get, gets, gotten, owner, possess, possessor, purchased, purchaser, recover, redeem, sold, surely buy. Now that's interesting. This is from the Strong's, obviously an exhaustive concordance. Now, nowhere did I read this word quana means to be created or something to be made. That's kind of an interesting observation. Hmm, I wonder why that would be. Well, because in the proper context, when you're reading, when you're reading Proverbs 8 or any of the other chapters, who in their right mind, maybe you are not in your right mind, I don't want to offend you in that sense, but maybe we got to straighten some of these things out, knock out some of those cobwebs. Point is, Anybody with half a brain, common sense knows that God has always had wisdom. He is all-knowing, all-powerful, right? Has all knowledge, right? God has always has wisdom. So when you're reading, right? When you're reading, let's just see if I can actually do this here and see if this works. Does that work? Nope. I have to actually go back and do that, do I? All righty then. Let's do this over here real quick. Apparently, I can't multi multitask here. Let's try this. Here. So back over here to Proverbs. So let's go over here. So we're at Proverbs. This is the King James now. So notice here, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was, right? When there was no depths, I was brought forth. When there's no fountains abounding with water, before the fountains were settled, before the hills were brought forth, while as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set up a compass or uh, circle the depth of the earth, the face of the depth, he established the clouds above. When he strengthened the fountains of the deep, all these different things, it points to that God is talking about God's wisdom, right? This is understanding, knowledge, God's all power, all knowing, right? It's Hebrew poetry personified talking about wisdom. Again, I want to point everyone watching, look. Does not wisdom cry? Understanding put forth her voice. Hebrew poetry, people. Hebrew poetry. Again, verse 12. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out witty inventions. I mean, over here, check this out. If you were to go to Hebrews or Proverbs chapter 9, let's see if it actually takes me here. Look at this here. Wisdom has builded her house. She has shown her seven pillars. She has killed her beasts. And it goes on and on and on, talking about wisdom. So wisdom is personified from chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So to try to attempt to make this verse here, right, this here, talking about Jesus Christ, is a far stretch. Now, again, I know there have been Christian scholars and pastors who have, uh, you know, they've done it. They, they believe it. Now, of course, they do not believe any of those that I'm aware of anyway, who are Christian theologians, who believe this. If they, if they do reference it to Jesus, that it means he was created and at some point didn't exist or something like that. It would always mean that this was Jesus Christ, who was always, always eternally existent with the Father. So that's an important point, even though I don't believe that to be biblically the case here with this being referenced to Jesus. But those who at least theologians who have done that, they believe that this, if they do 
allude to this being Jesus, they always have taught that I'm aware of anyway, that Jesus is always the eternal one with the Father, not that he came into existence or wasn't not existence at some point. That's an important point to understand, okay? Now, getting back to how to respond to Jehovah's Witnesses. How do we respond to Jehovah's Witnesses, other groups, Seventh-day Adventists, Unitarians, and other groups who try to say Proverbs 8 teaches this is Jesus Christ. Well, what about um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1? Now, some people, that's that's a text that sometimes is tried to be connected of the two. All right, so let's go there for a second. Now, I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard. Actually, no, let's stick with what I was saying. Let's stick with it. Uh, King James. King James, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And what does it say over here? Now, this is a huge point as well. The Apostle Paul is not, in my opinion my opinion, not in any way connecting the dots here that this is talking about Proverbs 8. I think you have to read into that uh, belief into that text to make it say what you want it to say rather than what it actually does say. Remember, remember this. Paul is teaching in Corinthians that the cross, the gospel, is foolishness to those who are perishing. Remember? Remember there was divisions. From verses 12 and on, go that some are claiming to be of uh, Apollos, some are claiming to be of Peter and Paul. And Paul goes on to say, has Christ been divided? Has Paul been crucified for you? No, right? He goes on to say here, check it out. I thank God, verse 14, I baptize none of you except for Crispus and Gaius. At least anyone should say I was baptized in my own name, that I baptized in my own name. I baptize also the household of Stephanas. Besides that, I don't know who else, any other that I baptize, right? So Paul is not saying that baptism is not good or whatever. He says he wasn't sent to do it. That wasn't his primary mission. His primary mission was what? To preach the gospel. Look at verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So here's an important point too. Baptism, water baptism, is not a part of the gospel for salvation. Being water baptized is a commandment. It represents our death, burial, and resurrection of, of what Christ did for us. So us going into the water, Romans chapter 6 coming out, represents a newness of life in Christ. But nowhere do we see this being taught as the gospel. There's a clear distinction. And when you properly understand Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts 15, 1 Peter chapter 3, and these other ones, all the context of being baptized have the reference to being identified with Christ of a changed life and heart, but not the actual physical water. The physical water is not what saves anybody. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's start in verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? Has not God made the foolishness, the foolish, the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world... By wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. So that's an interesting point. The Jewish people were wanting to see all these signs and wonders. The Greeks were people of philosophy. They wanted wisdom, right? It's interesting to me, if you read the Gospel of John chapter 1, John is probably one of the best apologists out there, probably other than, of course, Paul, probably. But when you read John's gospel, he wrote it in such a way that it ministered to the Greek people and to the Jewish. Because it says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Well, John, last epistles, his books, as he's coming to the latter of age, he's the last of the apostles to live. Some died around 90-something A.D. or so, wrote his books around that time frame, right? 
all the different false teachings, everything that's going on out there. He is writing his gospel to point to who is Jesus Christ, right? And he compares Jesus Christ to the Greeks of the Logos, the source of all creation, right? Gen or John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's the word Logos, right? And verse 3 says, for all things came into existence through him, and not, apart from him, not even one thing came into existence. This refutes Jehovah's Witnesses. This refutes Unitarians. This refutes Islam, Muslim, and so many other groups that reject the deity of Jesus Christ. If you can understand the Gospel of John, just a few verses, my goodness, you you will you you will not get trapped into the cults of the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Seventh Day Adventists, the Unitarians, Islam, Oneness Pentecostals, and a lot of other groups out there that are unfortunately counterfeit movements in the name of Jesus Christ. But when you know the biblical Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, as a distinct person of the Father and the Holy Spirit, and you understand what the scriptures teach, just in simplicity, the Gospel of John is such a a powerful book. I encourage you to get into that book. Such a good book. But back to Corinthians here. Check this out. The Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. Verse 22. But Paul says this. We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. Unto the Greeks foolishness. Now here's the key verse. Verse 24. That is a little bit under controversy. For people anyway. But unto them which are called. Both Jews and Greeks. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? Christ is the power of God. He's the source for all creation. John chapter 1. He's the one that created all things. He's the wisdom. Of, the wisdom of God is in reference to the gospel message. Remember verse 18? For those who are believing, to them they are being saved. But for those who are rejecting, verse 18, let's read it. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us, which is being saved, it is the power of God. The gospel is what's being talked about here, both the power of God and the wisdom of God. Remember this. When you read throughout the, the gospels, many people were perplexed. They were confused. They were expecting a certain kind of Messiah, a certain deliverer, a certain king. They knew that the Old Testament talked about this coming Messiah, this prophecy of, of one to come. But they did not accept him as a humble servant, the one who was going to die upon the cross and die for them. When you read the book of Acts, it talks about many places that if they would have known that he was the coming one, they wouldn't have crucified him. So this is the wisdom of God. To the world, it's foolishness. If you watch anything today, when you talk to atheists today, they think Christians are nuts. I've talked to so many atheists, they think we're whack. They think I'm out of my mind. How can you believe in this Jesus guy? It's foolishness. It's crazy. It's wacky, they say, right? Look, the world thinks the gospel is foolishness. They hate it. But for us who are Christians, we understand this is the wisdom of God. This is the mystery. This is what Paul talks about in the other books, like Ephesians and, and other books, they talked about this is the mystery that's been revealed. Amen? So the power of God is the gospel. The wisdom of God is the gospel. That's what Paul is talking about. Paul is not saying this is pointing to Proverbs chapter 8. That's just not accurate. It's unbiblical. So let's wrap up here. Does Proverbs 8 truly teach this is in reference to Jesus Christ? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Now, if for the slight chance I'm wrong, because it is possible that, that Kelly Powers could be wrong. I've been wrong on things before, and I'll, hope, I'll humbly admit it. But I can tell you this. When you read Proverbs 8 properly in its context, if by chance this is referencing Jesus, which I do not believe it is, because I believe the clear context is talking about wisdom in general, Hebrew poetry, when you look at uh, chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, look at the words prudence, knowledge, discretion, all these different things, it's clear this is Hebrew poetry. That's just, I, I'm, I'm really confident in that. But if not, what I can say is this. If it's talking about it, it does not teach. He was created, first to be created, brought into existence, whatever else. The word quana has various meanings, but it does not have the meaning to be made from nothing, to be brought into existence out of nowhere. It talks about having something that's been acquired, to be owned, to be possessed, something that's been with them 
from the very beginning. And that's the wisdom of God. God has always had wisdom. Amen? Amen. So next time you're talking to a Jehovah's Witness, this is what I want to encourage you how to respond. Look, this is the simplest way that I can say it. Because Jehovah's Witnesses have been taught. They've got their magazines. You see some of my books by my bookshelf behind me. They've got lots of magazines. They do lots of things to confuse and stump people. Here's what I normally try to say. Look, I know this is what you believe. I understand, and we want to get into the Greek and all that. It's great, too. Let's just look at the context of Proverbs 8 for just a moment. Let's just try to keep it simple. Let's have a conversation. Let's start verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What is the context of what's being talked about with wisdom here? Is it really? Do you really think he's talking about a person? Well, then what about prudence? What about discretion? What about knowledge? Who are these people apparently then, right? Who are those? And then what about Proverbs 9 or 7 or 8? All these other places that wisdom's up. Are these places supposed to be Jesus too? When you see the consistency, the consistency of the content pointing that wisdom here is in reference to Hebrew poetry, many places these kind of things are personified. They do not teach specifically about a person or specifically even as some try to go far about Jesus Christ. Well, I came on today, wanted to share this quickly. I know there's people in the room right now. I'm going to be closing this down. I uh, just want to do a live teaching on this, want to get it out there for you, my brothers and sisters. God bless you. Thank you for those of you who watched the Baran Perspective. Thank you so much for those of you who encourage and leave comments. Thank you so much. Um, please share this video with other people. Let other people know how to respond to Jehovah's Witness and others who try to teach that Proverbs 8 is talking about Jesus when, in fact, it is not. May you continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ who came to this earth some 2,000 years. He died upon the cross for you, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13 says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus has been raised from the dead, you confess with your lips, you call upon his name, believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. God loves you. He wants to give you a new life and a new hope. He does not want judgment for you. He has no hatred for you. Whatever sins you've committed, you can turn from them now. May you do that today. Lord bless you all. Thank you for being a part of this today. Until the next time, God bless you.